And hello to everyone who's joining us today for our webinar, Reinvesting and Rebounding, where the evidence points for accelerating learning. We are so excited for you to be here today. We're going to start in about three minutes, but as you come on, if you could share with us in the chat where you are coming from. I already see that we have some shout outs here. I see Sarah from Morrow, Georgia, which is, I'm from Atlanta. And could you also identify any questions you would like to get answered today? Because we all know, and this is why we're hosting this webinar today, that things have been going on in our wonderful field of education. And we wanna really start that conversation and move us all forward in the right direction. So please, if there are any questions that are rolling around and your thoughts right now, drop those in the chat. And also let us know where you are from. I see my Clayton County Public School District is here, um, which is great. Also see um, greetings from Washington and from Las Vegas. Arizona. We have everyone in the house today ready to learn, ready to roll up our sleeves and understand better how to reinvest in what we believe is our most precious, um, just our students, our teachers, our families, our communities. So what is most precious to us and how do we rebound? And so it's so great to have everybody coming in today and getting ready to hear from our panelists. So we'll get started in a minute. All right, we are at the top of the hour and there are so many um, wonderful opportunities for learning today. So I don't want to prolong the time. I am Dr. Sanja Hollins Alexander. I am the Director of Professional Learning for Corwin. And I wanna tell you a little bit about who Corwin is. Um, we are your partner in professional learning. We were founded in 1990 as an affiliate of SAGE Publications with a laser focus on providing evidence-based solutions for those serving the field of K-12 educators. Since that time, we have expanded our practice-oriented publications to cover pre-K actually through 16, offering learning experiences such as the one that you are involved in today with our world-renowned authors in webinar format. We also offer institutes where we introduce the content in a professional learning format like a conference. And we also have on on-site professional learning um, and virtual consulting engagements, partnering with over 1,800 schools and districts globally. And the other thing that we're so proud about is our commitment to partnering with organizations that are also focused on this work and focused on you, like AESA and AASA. So today we are partnering with AASA on this webinar. I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Dan Dominich, who will take it from here and share a few more details about our webinar today. Dan. Sonja, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I'm Dan Dominich and I'm the executive director for AASA, the School Superintendents Association. We are uh, undoubtedly uh, probably one of the longest uh, and oldest education organizations in the United States since we were founded in 1865. And our mission is to be advocates on behalf of public education and to offer professional development to educational leaders. 
We are very pleased and proud to be able to co-sponsor this event today, reinventing and rebounding what the evidence points to in terms of accelerated learning. As we know, this is a major topic today with all of our school superintendents around the country, and you're gonna hear some really exciting information today. We're gonna answer or look at questions like, what do we mean by accelerating, uh, accelerated learning? Uh, what is visible learning research? Uh, what analysis of learning recovery strategies should we be looking at? And most importantly, what's the impact on federal funding going to be on all of these promising practices. So uh, without further ado, uh, let me turn it back uh, to uh, Sonja for some housekeeping items. Sonja? Yes, and so just wanted to let you all know um, that there are a few um, upcoming webinars um, in addition to this one. And of course you can see what they are, but as I mentioned, we're your partner in learning. So we're always looking at ways to introduce these amazing concepts through our amazing authors and webinar format. I also want to identify for you some Zoom keeping um, additional things that we need to do while we're here together. So first, of course, you know, we've all been in this virtual space for a moment, but we wanna make sure our cameras and our mics are muted. And something that's extremely important, and one of the things that's true and dear to my heart is engagement. That chat box is so important, and so I already see that it's on fire. You all are also providing where you're from, and so we will also provide other links to information in that chat box. So make sure that on your screen, you keep your chat box open so we can keep the conversation going. And then this webinar is being recorded. So by attending this webinar, you consent to all of the webinar terms. If that's different, then of course, now is the time to make that decision, but we certainly hope that you continue to engage with us. It's going to be a great hour of power. Thank you, Sonja. And uh, now it's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce your moderator uh, for this uh, webinar. Uh, that's Noel Ellison Eng, uh, who heads up our advocacy and governance programs at AASA. Noel, I turn it to you. Well, well, actually, Dan, I, I missed a little bit. I need to, to introduce those panelists. And then oh, we will about that. Over. <laughs> No, 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 it's okay. I had a quick pause, but let me introduce our panelists today. We have um, Dr. John Amarode, who is an associate professor and executive director of teaching and learning in the College of Education at James Madison University. He has authored multiple articles, reports, book chapters, and over a dozen books on effective teaching and learning in today's schools and classrooms, including the Success Criteria Playbook and Great Teaching by Design. We also have Dr. Nancy Frey, who is Professor in Educational Leadership at San Diego State University and a leader at Health Sciences High and Middle College. She has been a special education teacher, reading specialist, and administrator in public schools. She has published numerous books, including Rebound, which you will hear a little bit more about and the distance learning playbook. And we also have um, Professor John Hattie. Dr. Hattie is a researcher and author with nearly 30 years of experience examining what works best in student learning and achievement. His research, better known as visible learning, is a culmination of nearly 30 years of synthesizing more than 1,600 meta-analyses comprising more than 90,000 studies involving over a third billion students around the world. And so I wanted to introduce you to our amazing panelists and we'll now turn it over to Noel so that we can get moving and going today. Noel? That sounds great. Thanks, Sonja, for that introduction, Dan, for your introduction. And I don't know what I'm more excited about. The paper that you're here to discuss the researchers and authors leading this discussion and sharing their additional thought, thoughts and insights, or the privilege that we get to do both for the remainder of this hour. So I'm super excited to be here. We appreciate everyone taking time for what we know is a very busy schedule to discuss this important work. So I'm gonna jump right in because the money, the content is really with the researchers and our authors here with John, Nancy, and John. So the first question. Noel, I'll just like to interrupt. 
Everybody in the chat room is saying that they can't hear you. I am not muted on my phone or, can you guys hear me? I hear her fine. I can hear you, but everybody in the chat room. Uh, I'm, oh, there they I'm are. getting a mixed oh, reviews. Okay. Yeah. Test one, test one. Please keep the feedback in the chat. This is yeah, so we're bizarre. still getting those messages. Uh, Sabrina. I'm going to disconnect my audio and reconnect on the phone, okay? So I'm going to go mute and I'll cue you when I'm back, but I want to make sure people can hear me, so please hold. All right, Noel. I'm also going to enable live transcription. I'm hopeful that for those folks who might not be able to hear Noel, that they're able to see the live transcription. If folks in the chat could let me know if they're able to see the live transcript now. Perfect. I'm seeing that people can see the live transcript. So maybe we can have Noel do a quick test that way so we have a backup. And just to proceed, it's touch ahead. Um, can, can people hear me speaking? I'm just worried about whether the panelists are also in the same dilemma. Yes, thank you. Okay. You know, there's always these little technology <laughs> gremlins that are just lurking on the side. The great but news we... is that we have developed a lot of resilience about how to do this, right? <laughs> well, here's a gremlin I hope everyone can hear. This is Noelle Ellerson in. Can the panelists hear me? And people in the chat box, we're hoping that my voice is coming through now. Still not yeah. yes, you can hear. I'm yeah. able to hear Noel. For those folks who I'm are not able to proceed and just follow, yes. follow the tech, tech advice. They, so yeah, they I'm can hear you now, Noel. The questions. I really appreciate everyone's patience with that and the redirect. So I'm going to start first with a question for Nancy and John Elmerode. The historic influx of emergency federal funding available to schools in response to COVID has the potential to be a game changer as it relates to how we think of the new normal of schooling past COVID. With a quick first question, what aspect of the federal funding most excites you as it relates to supporting schools in their work to accelerate learning? Nancy? Well, I think one of the most exciting parts is the, the part B of the coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act. I have to look at my notes to be able to say that. I would like to know who it is that makes these titles. Um, but here's the short version of this, right? It's $54 billion. So you know which one I'm talking about. And this has a longer tail to it. The spending limits on that go out until the end of September in 2023, which really... Uh, creates for all of us uh, a great opportunity. Now, I had mentioned Part B, and Part B is specifically about implementing evidence-based activities to meet the comprehensive needs of students. Again, I'm reading off of my notes because I want to make sure that we're getting the wording all right about that. And when we're talking about acceleration, I think that we need first to be able to explain what do we mean by accelerated learning? What does that actually look like. And what it comes down to is that we should be and we are and we are going to leverage our expertise as educators in order to be able to make decisions every day about content, about concepts, and about skills. I mean, that's really the short uh, version of all of this. In order to do that, in order to do those evidence-based activities, then we need to think about what high-quality assessments are and what it is that they look like. We need to be able to telescope the curriculum to really hone in on on uh, what it is that we want to intervene on. And John Almerod, I know that you like to say, you need to know the difference between need to know and need to know. I love that, right? We're also having to make decisions uh, about what level of intensity uh, should those accelerated learning efforts be, and especially utilizing those evidence-based activities. A concern that I have is that there's a lot of money that's there to be sure, and we're grateful for that, but that there can be this oversimplification of uh, what it will take to be able to do that, that it is simply a matter of finding time, creating time, and getting a warm body in the room. 
And that somehow magically, those two things alone are going to deliver those breakthrough results that we're looking for. We have to invest in the knowledge of teachers, of leaders, in order to be able to get those going. So something that I've been thinking about, and John and John, I'd love to hear from you as well, is that part of that investment needs to be with leaders. And I'm thinking in particular that we, we always have a shortage of principles. There's always a principal pipeline problem. Let's take some of that money and over hire around folks like assistant principals, around instructional coaches that are going to be charged specifically with being able to coach up those educators that are working in here. What it means in that regard too, is that we build a workforce that we can sustain over the long haul, not only investing in tutors and so on, which are a piece of this, but investing in the long haul about what it is that schools will look like going forward. And one thing that we know is that ongoing support around the professionalism of educators is vital. Let's take those opportunities to be able to create those supports in very real and material ways. I love, I love the response. Um, and there was, there are two words in there, Nancy, that you used to just jump out and it's the comprehensive needs of, of our students. Those two words, that comprehensive need statement. What excites me the most is we have historic funding. Um, that's the impetus um, in the context of an international pandemic. And so you've got this, this perfect combination of impetus and focus um, to really zero in on, on what does work best because we're dealing with something that none of us have experienced in our lifetime um, uh, to this magnitude. Now there are, and John uh, um, Hattie has, has spoken to this, there, are, there have been moments where we've had breaks in the continuity of, of instruction, uh, but something of this magnitude is new for all of us. And so it's the idea that we have the perfect opportunity to really focus on what works best. And so that means we have to meet the comprehensive needs of our students by doing several things. One, we have to sharpen those assessment skills. I've seen a couple of comments in the chat box about um, absolutely no assessments during the first six weeks. Um, I think one of it, one of those ideas is we have to expand what we mean by assessments. We're going to have to assess the first day they walk in the door, but it doesn't mean we have to set them down and give them a multiple choice assessment for two hours. Instead, what kind of tasks uh, what kind of um, experiences can we provide them that make their learning and thinking visible so that I have a feel for where those learners are in their progression. So we're going to have to sharpen our assessment skills. That's a great thing. We're going to have to expand our understanding of what it means to, to know thy impact and, vis and make learning visible. It also brings to the forefront equity. One of the things that I'm very excited about in this funding is that it's going to force us to come to terms with equity and access and opportunity of the highest learning possible. Because now we're going to have learners showing up in our classrooms that do not fit the dangerous stereotypes we've often experienced in our schools. Now we've got learners that we actually don't know what's been happening, but we got to figure it out. And so how do we make sure there's equitable uh, experiences and access? And so it's using then that information to implement what works best, moving beyond just, oh, that's an evidence-based practice, that's an evidence-based practice. Instead, how do we implement it so that we get the potential impact that the research says we should get? And that comes down to implementation. And that's what excites me about this historic funding. I think what you're you're bringing up to is a question around grain size and uh, staying relentlessly focused on what it is that students need. That's an important part of that. And how is it that what it is that students need inform how it is that we create systems to be able to do that? A caution that I have is that we should not be building systems based on the last time that we saw kids. So we do need to have that assessment information. And as you said, to really be able to expand what it is that we mean by assessment. And so this is where I would jump in and say plus one, even from an AASA perspective, and I'm a former high school special ed teacher, 
I think that this expanding what we know to be assessments is really where the rubber is going to hit the road because all educators are doing assessments every day. When you walk, when children walk in the classroom, you're assessing their body language. And it's really that conversation about ensuring that the instructional information that the teachers and educators rely on, it's clarifying that particularly from a federal level, assessment doesn't just mean statewide standardized. There are very rich state administered assessments, locally administered assessments, formative and summative. And it's really about having an expansive view to empower state and local education agencies to make the decisions they need to do all this exciting, enticing work that you're talking about with this opportunity that we've been afforded if we want to talk about the, a silver lining within the COVID pandemic. So related to that, though, because my context here was all just somewhat rosy, there's the important work of being realistic in goals and managing expectations. And there is a scenario where a school district could invest well, could invest purposely, could be driven by data to help work where their students are towards where they want to get them. They could implement beautifully and succeed in really accelerating learning. And there could still be academic achievement gaps. Is this something to be worried about? Do you think there's a chance some will expect the huge amount of funding should be able to fix all of what schools need? I wanna start with John Hattie here. Well, the, the thing that we, we've got to be really aware of in this process is this notion of progress through to achievement. Um, I know we often get fixated about high achievement, but what's more important than high achievement is that notion of what you're calling assessment, and I'd prefer to call discovery, because assessment implies testing. The discovery process, which includes testing, but there includes the observations you make, and I hope that we never presume that every child that comes into our class, we don't presume that they can, that they had negative effects or positive effects from COVID, but we do in our, our discovery of where they're at. And then we, we, we look at the progress we make. Now, some of those kids, particularly with this extra money, will make incredible progress from a very low base. And we should be extremely proud when that happens. Some students who start above the average might not make much progress, and we should be concerned about that. But the first kid is still not high achieving. The second kid is, is high achieving, but it's a mixed message. High achievement's not necessarily a good thing if kids are just maintaining what they were over the last year. So looking at that, the other criteria that we should be worried about here is making our classes inviting, making sure that every kid feels invited to come to school, uh, particularly given what's happened over the last year. School's a different experience for some, given they were working at home. So if I ask your students, do you want to be here to study the kind of things that we're working in class? That's a pretty important question. And if you look at the Jenkins curve, 95% plus of five and six year olds want to be there. But by the end of elementary school, it dips to about four out of 10. So we need to worry about that as one of the criteria we want to improve because I go to the third one, and that is the number of years of schooling. The economists have shown us that that's a better predictor of adult health, wealth, and happiness than achievement. And so what ways are we making our, our, our programs such that kids want to come back and finish the final years of schooling and want to go on and do more fur further work? And so I think we've got an incredible opportunity here to worry about those three aspects. What is our progress? Making our classes inviting, and then trying to find ways where students stay on in this business called schooling. And so I think that this money is not going to fix everything. We know that there's never enough for that, but we certainly can make huge differences for those kids. So the messages don't presume. Some of our students above average did not succeed very well during COVID. Some of our students below average did succeed. And we need to understand why does they succeeded when they weren't regularly in our classrooms and bring back wiser some of those attributes such as using the technology in our regular classroom. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we should go back and make kids stay at home, but we can use some of the ways that we use through Zoom and other methods to teach kids how to do self-regulation and reduce that pressure on teachers to be in control all the time. And I think we had a lot to learn from that. You know, one of the things, John, that um, and Nancy, that that is so fascinating in studies about teaching and learning, uh, particularly in in studies on the science of learning. So I think we're going to see an influx of those sorts of studies um, and, and that sort of work: the science of reading, the science of math, the science. Of, excuse me, just a second. 
So what we're going to see, though, is that in all of those studies on the science of learning, the science of reading, the science studies, is that they all assume a motivated learner. And that's not always a safe assumption, and it's certainly not a realistic assumption. So I think the motivational component of that and the welcoming part of that is vital. The other thing that I, I often uh, try to highlight as best as possible is that growth precedes achievement. And so while the learners that are at or above achievement that may show no growth, absolutely something needs to be done there. The other part is recognizing that learners that are making incredible growth but haven't cr across the achievement gap yet that is still success to be celebrated as we build the efficacy of those learners, as we build the credibility of those learners, the competence, the self-regulation, the self-monitoring. There's so much to be done associated with growth that all precedes achievement. Okay, what I'm gonna do for convenience here is I'm gonna ask my boss, Dan Dominich, to prompt these questions and he's going to do that for the participation of our participants. This isn't fun. So Dan, I'm gonna drop this question to you in the chat and have you read it um, and share. So Dan, check the chat, please. There. Okay, uh, so if this is the third question, it's the uh, quality of the uh, teacher and teaching is the most important controllable factor, and you can see it here, that impacts student learning. What could uh, LEA investment of federal dollars in this area include? So this uh, uh, suggests that school districts would be uh, adding to the federal dollars, their own dollars uh, from their own budget uh, for this particular effort. Panelists? Yeah, so one of the things I think is, is a fine line to walk here um, is, is that if you pull, um, if you go straight to the visible learning database, um, you can often get trapped into the size of a, of a certain effect, a certain Cohen's D, and get sucked into, wow, that, that's a low effect size. That must, hang on a second. Uh, part of the challenge with this funding is recognizing and being straight up and, and honest, you know, there will be structural changes to how we do school. Uh, the extended school day, changes in the calendar, uh, summer school, there will be the purchasing of technologies, there will be those effects sizes or influences that have effect sizes that can be uh, misleading if we look at them as low effect sizes. So let me just say that right up front. Those changes, those purchases are expected. We're going to have to, and there's going to be adjustments to that school calendar. Um, but when you talk about the others, um, the trick though is that once we've identified and established how we're going to do school structurally, um, whether we're going to continue to have virtual academies and live options, whether we're going to have hybrid models, whether we're going to um, extend the school year, once those decisions are made, the attention then has to shift to fostering, nurturing, and sustaining the capacity and efficacy of the teachers and therefore the, the expertise. Um, if they really are the most important factor, and I say that in jest, uh, they absolutely are the most important factor for which we have some control over or the most control over. If they do have that much impact, then our goal is to support the expertise in developing their capacity and efficacy to do the discovery, discovering where their learners are in their learning journey. Um, what decisions are available to us in where to go next in that learning journey, um, which interventions have the highest probability of that happening. Uh, and then finally, how do we constantly build in different ways of evaluating our impact? Uh, what's my point here is that this funding, while there are situations and there are gonna be, it's unavoidable, we're going to have to make structural changes and calendar changes. Once that happens, it's what happens inside of those structural changes that matters most. It's not that they have the option of summer school, it's what we do while they're in summer school. It's not that we have an extended school day, it's what they do in that extended school day that matters the most. And so the attention must immediately shift from here's how we're gonna do it or here's what the framework looks like. Now let's go look at the expertise, the capacity and the efficacy of those walking this out every day. How do we build that up so that we make the best use of the time we have available to us in teaching and learning? 
Uh, the next question I have is uh, what spending guidance should the uh, Department of Education provide LEAs on uh, this learning loss and evidence-based uh, inventions? So I, I think that part, yes, I think part of it is the messaging that needs to happen as well. I, I'm concerned about the use of the term learning loss. There's actually no evidence that students have lost their learning, that they've gone backwards, that we have seventh graders who now read at a fifth grade level. What we do have is unrealized potential. We have some unrealized learning and we have some unexpected learning because students and teachers and systems have also learned things along the way. So in terms of that guidance, that we hope to see. That guidance should include a strong message that says that job one is to find out what has worked well so that we can continue that to go. Job two, I believe, and I'm gonna quote John Hattie on this one, is that we need systems, we need educators to be able to know thy impact. And I'm gonna thank you for that term as well. That it has less to do with a magic sauce of strategies than it does with understanding what kinds of outcomes I'm looking for and how I'll know what those outcomes are, how I'll know who's making progress, who's not making progress, who's benefiting, who's not benefiting. That with all of the guidance that we anticipate getting from the Department of Education around this, that that clear messaging needs to be in place. That we're looking at unrealized potential, that we must think clearly about how it is that we measure impact, how it is that we understand our impact. And by the way, that's more than just standardized test scores. And that we look closely and deeply at what it is that has worked so that we can leverage that springboard from that going forward from there. Now, John, I know talked about um, discovery and diagnosis as being a part of uh, all of that. We need to do that for ourselves, for our systems, in, and not only something that we implement with students. Can I um, add, to, uh, you know, Nancy, the deficit thinking um, idea there, I think is one of the things we have to watch out for. Um, I, I think it was, it was either, I think it might've been you, we were in a meeting, you talked about how you used to have this vision of, of this learning loss vision of as learners are walking down the street, down the sidewalk, um, things just fall. Oh, there's eight times seven. Oh my gosh, there's the area of the triangle. Oh my goodness, there's symbolism in the Great Gatsby. The, this mentality that's just the deficit thinking, I think, is one of the, uh, the challenges we have to watch out for. And when you talk about uh, the leveraging of skills and expertise and, and building that capacity in teachers, I think one of the things to keep an ear to the ground for is that deficit thinking. The idea that because we have gone through this pandemic, somehow there's going to be this absolute huge loss of learning, and it can lead us to make decisions that move us away from accelerating learning and actually moving towards increasing the challenge and the problem for that next generation. For example, um, something as simple as finding the right level of challenge for learners. It's an essential theme in the visible learning research, finding the right level of challenge or the Goldilocks principle. But if I have a deficit view of my learners, then the porridge is always going to be too cold versus getting the porridge just right. Um, and I think the same thing goes for um, designing success criteria and experiences that get them there. The bid's always going to be too small. And so that deficit thinking can really take us down a path that's not accelerating learning. It may actually uh, unintentionally and, and, uh, and certainly with no malintent, it actually may be a barrier to that learning. Absolutely. And, you know, and I'm thinking about um, in particular and drawing from that visible learning database uh, about uh, what it is that we know works, wh what it is that we know that is effective. And there are some really important principles that are embedded within that that should inform 
any kind of intervention, any kind of um, uh, system for being able to support students. And those include things like knowing about deliberate practice and the effects of deliberate practice. And that deliberate practice is in actually practicing those things that are difficult, those things that are uh, of challenge. How do we know what's challenging? By assessing by assessing students and being able to uh, have that just in time kind of approach. Effective feedback is an important part of this. And, and as, as John has noted in his significant works around feedback, it's a matter of feedback received, not feedback given. The message isn't pour on more and more and more feedback. What's embedded underneath all of that is the relationship between the people that are giving feedback to one another, that feedback goes in both directions, that we gain feedback from our students. When our students are able to do X, Y, or Z, when our students learn X, Y, or Z, it's feedback to me about my own practice as well. These are should be deeply embedded in any of the practices that we do. And hopefully what happens is that it causes teachers to think about what it is that they do. That the, the secret sauce is not that there's, a, there's some sort of combination of things. And if they just do this combination of things, it'll work. But rather how it is they think about what it is that they're doing that matters. So let me ask another uh, question. Uh, one of the things we're thinking about at AASA is bringing this work to scale, both in terms of the amount of dollars schools need to spend in a short time, as, as well as the efficiencies that come from accessing support service interventions collaboratively. Can you speak to how the findings of this paper would apply in that scenario, where an ESA or other vendor could work to simultaneously support multiple districts at the same time? Dan, let, let me start there and, and comment that in a couple of years time, I think it was 2023, when this money runs out, we should be looking today to say, no, we're going to provide you government uh, districts, superintendents, we're going to provide you with the evidence that that extra resource you put in as a consequence, a consequence of COVID has worked so well, it needs to be maintained. And so that's why, as Nancy and John were talking there about collecting the evidence of having an impact of what we do is pretty critical right now to not only obviously to dramatically affect the learning lives of kids, but also to show that there are ways in which we can invest in education that can stay on. Like take, for example, the, and I know it's early days yet, but some systems are trying uh, to bring in coaches to work with particular kids on particular issues. Now, to really critical conditions, however, and this is what um, is, is happening here in Victoria at the moment, uh, here in Australia, is those coaches must be ex-teachers. Because you, if you bring in people that don't have the expertise that you folk have, then you're actually often compounding the problem in the wrong direction. And the second part of it, besides the expertise they have, such as ex-teachers or initial education students, is that you put in a, in, into place an individualized plan with each kid so that what those coaches are doing with the students is part and parcel of what happens in the classroom right now. It's not focusing out and doing specific things and teaching them particular isolated skills. It's got to relate to what the teacher is doing right now. And that is making a huge difference uh, to these kids. Now, what I think COVID has done and the words that I'd use is that it has amplified the equity issues. They were always there and they will always be there. And so a lot of the, the deficit thinking is picking out those kids and say, oh, isn't it terrible, they can't do it. They couldn't do those things before. So let's get away from that and say, no, we can invest such as in, in, in coaching in the classrooms and the way that we've talked about. We can invest in helping teachers uh, look at and have expertise, what helps them understand what their evaluation and their impact looks like. And I think there are so many things we can do with these dollars now make the difference. But the key thing is, and this is raised in the, in the white paper, is we also need to be a lot smarter about how we go about implementing whatever it is we do. So it doesn't just become a, a tackle. If we look 
at the four parts of the model that we've been using now for quite a few years, the DIE model. We look at that really good discovery, D, the discovery of the diagnosis. And as we've talked about, there are lots of ways in which you can do diagnosis, of which testing is one method, but not the only method. What matters more in testing isn't the testing, it's the interpretations that you're making about where you go next with these kids. The second part of the model is, as John A has pointed out, choosing high impact interventions. But the third part, that know thy impact part, the, the implementation is making sure that we're really good at implementing. And sometimes we think we are. And this is a really good use of some of those extra dollars is how do we get help at our schools to look at the fidelity of what we're implementing, look at the dosage, look at whether each student is getting the, the effect in the implementation. So often in schools, we introduce policies that are very poorly implemented. And the third part of the DIE model is that evaluation, which is actually quite easy if you get the discovery part right first. It's just the discovery done again at the end. So I think we need to spend a, some of those dollars looking at our implementation in our schools, making sure that every student is affected by the interventions we put into place. And we really do, should be making a concerted effort to collect that kind of evaluation at the, at the individual student level, the case management level, to demonstrate that it really has made a difference, which is why we need to sustain it beyond 2023. I love the emphasis on implementation. It's one of the challenges we 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 see most often in teacher in teacher education is that you know teacher educators we spend our time getting them ready to go into the field but we often leave out that key element of implementation uh, jigsaw is always the example i go to jigsaw has i mean it's 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 quoted all the time oh it has an effect size of 1.20 the effect size in that case is potential right so even if i go after high yield interventions that implementation piece is key what happens if i don't take time to discover who my learners are and I provide text for the jigsaw that's not appropriate. Its complexity is, is not aligned with where my learners are. Its difficulty is not right. Or I don't build in the structures, the norms, the processes for how to interact. Then I'm never actually going to see the 1.20 return on investment. Right. And so that implementation is key. So when we talk about um, recommendations in this particular paper about what to do, I can't emphasize this enough. It's building the capacity of the teachers to do what needs to be done to focus on that rebound and reinvesting. It's not to say that it's not there, but one of the hardest things I encountered as a teacher myself is teaching algebra one to individuals that had uh, limited English proficiency. That was my first teaching job. And I had high intentions. I had noble goals. The problem was I did not have the capacity yet to take strategies that I had in my toolkit and implement in a way that aligned with the, the progress and where my learners were in their own journey. And I think that's one of the biggest things to focus on is how do we design professional learning communities or professional learning uh, environments that help teachers express where support is needed. They have the evidence to, to articulate where that common challenge or support is, and then doing something to build that capacity where it's needed. Uh, that implementation piece is so, so vital. Knowing that you have tools is one thing. Knowing how to use them is something completely different. And I think that's where we can, can provide the most support to teachers who are gonna raise their hand and say, I just don't know what to do here. And then those that are already doing it. And that's another thing John Hattie has said for, for years that I love, excellence is in our schools. So how do we capitalize on the excellence that's already in our schools to build that collective efficacy? I'm looking at Rebecca's uh, comment in the chat as well, this idea of, of moving into implementation science. And Dan, as I think about the question that you posed, what does this look like for uh, educational service agencies? What does this look like for vendors when you're supporting multiple districts along the way? And I think that that frame exactly is the way in which educational service agencies can support the districts that are in their catchment area by always looking at the various interventions and approaches and wrapping it in an apparatus that says that we discover and we diagnose that we look at implementation and at intervention 
so that we know the magnitude of our impact, that we're able to evaluate that. And through that evaluation, that we can then make the necessary revisions that are needed so that we don't have to wait until September of 2023 to find out, oops, it didn't work after all. We want to be able to make those changes in real time to be able to best fit the context of students, of teachers, and of districts. And that apparatus of thinking through whatever your approach is going to be, that's a great way for educational service agencies to be able to support the districts that are in their area. Uh, thank you for that point. Uh, having been a superintendent of an educational service agency, what they call BOCES in New York State, uh, that's a very effective and cost efficient way to, to deal with a lot of these issues, particularly when you consider that of the 14,000 school districts in America, about a third of them uh, have about a thousand students or less. So for, for a good number of school districts, that kind of cooperation and collaboration that an educational service agency can provide is a pretty good step. So thank you for, for bringing that up. Let me ask a question that's uh, in the uh, Q&A uh, that you might want to tackle. Uh, the question is, does anyone anticipate or foresee the compounding effect of less seat time? Less seat time equals less content. Less content equals less deliberate practice. This means the teacher next year has to remediate before students can progress. This needs to remediate in turn causes less seat time. Any thoughts on how to break this vicious cycle if there is such a thing? Yeah, I'd love to, to comment on that because I'm not a great fan that if you uh, necessarily lengthen the seat time, you lengthen the school year, you're necessarily going to get a different effect. Uh, if you keep doing the same things that haven't worked before, then having more time, uh, adding summer school, adding the school year, isn't going to make an effect. I also want to remind us that um, if, if you look at some of the evidence coming out now about what happened last year uh, during the COVID testing, I think it's quite remarkable. Every piece of data I have seen so far says that on average, we did just as well last year as we've done in the previous 10 years, which attests to the incredible expertise that teachers demonstrated last year, switching from the in-class to the distance learning. Now that's on average. So the first thing is, I, I think that the message is uh, a, a tremendous tick of approval of what teachers did last year to accommodate a really weird and, and not very nice situation. Now, of course, that's the average. That's why I wanna sp specifically, and we've talked about here, be very good at diagnosis to make sure we don't presume and we look at which students did have some not the success they should have compared to others. Mm -hmm. But then we also should look at what we do with them when we have them. And I think that's what I really want to say we should be focusing on that, not just asking for more time, more seat time. Some teachers can do remarkable things with less time than other teachers. But I think the one thing that we should look at here to make sure that we're doing this in a very effective manner is also to say, how do we use this money to invest in teacher collaboration? So that teachers are working with other teachers to question some of the assumptions that teachers have about kids, some of the uh, ways in which we can share a better understanding of certain students and how we're making progress. We can do collaboration to make sure that we're doing shared diagnosis and shared interpretation. And if you're going to do collaboration, and we know collective efficacy is one of the most powerful things we do, that costs. I'd rather spend the money on teacher time to have those discussions and spend it on student time to have more sitting in the same seat. And you, we started off, Nancy, you made the comment about acceleration. Acceleration can often mean telescoping, doing less and having more impact and focusing on what students really need by really excellent discovery and diagnosis so we can have the resources to make a difference. But I ask you to think of not necessarily increasing kids' seat time, but increasing teachers' seat time so that they can have those interpretive discussions that really does make the difference right across the school. I think one of the remarkable changes that has happened in so many districts uh, around the country and other countries as well is the notion, especially as many systems have moved to a hybrid learning kind of a schedule and uh, an understanding that students perhaps should be going to school four days a week and that we leave one day a week for the teachers 
to be able to work to collaborate with one another. That was unheard of in February of 2020. Nobody did that five days a week. These are the instructional minutes. That's what we do. That's a profound change. And I think there's evidence there that that teacher collaboration makes a difference. Why haven't we had the learning loss, so to speak, that we worried about earlier this year? Maybe it's because in part, teachers are finding ways to be able to work with one another. I've been really, um, and this is anecdotal to be sure, but over and over, I have heard teachers and principals talking about the uptake in micro teaching this year, because suddenly it became easy for people to be able to record what it was that they were doing, bring it to their colleagues, and then say, help me think through this process. Micro teaching's got that great, great potential to be able to really advance teaching along the way. Again, let's capture those things that, that are working so that we can reconceive what it is that school looks like going forward. One of the things that- um, Thank you, Nancy. So one of the things that comes out of this also is the concept of, of remediation. I think I think we have to rethink that entire uh, approach because if a if if a learner's never had exposure, so there are two ways I'm thinking about this, and I'm gonna try to make sure my my mouth and my brain align, and that may not be the case here. But if students have never had exposure to a piece of content or a skill or or understanding, then that's not remediation. So that's that's new learning. The other thing is, and so that's a different scenario than a learner who had an experience with it, but it didn't promote that elaborate encoding. It didn't promote, uh, they didn't have opportunities for retrieval practice. There wasn't, uh, there wasn't the marinating of, of the science of learning on, on letting it stick from acquisition to consolidation to storage, but instead it was very quick and, and it didn't work so well and it had other factors involved. Now that may require some uh, some relearning. So new learning versus relearning. But when it comes to remediation, I think we have to move into um, a, a closer look at our standards, both vertically and horizontally. So what are they like horizontally? What are they like vertically? So when a student comes into math class, if they did not get linear equations and I'm teaching geometry, I'm not going to remediate linear equations. What I'm going to do, though, is when I teach geometry and I teach complementary angles, one of those unknown angles is going to be X. The other unknown angle is going to be 2X plus 6. And you're going to have to put it together into an equation that equals 180 degrees. And I think that, that we have to look at not as remediation, but then how do I integrate and embed skills, content, and understandings at the right time when I'm about to move into something new. So it's breaking down the core learning for today to find out what they need to know. And Nancy, thanks for bringing this up because you put it right on the forefront of my brain. What they need to know versus what is neat to know and getting them what they need to know today to be successful and building from there versus an entire redo of third grade during the first few weeks of fourth grade. Because again, we may not have the discovery evidence that says we even need to do that. Um, and it's that approach that I think we have to really, as a math and science person, I would be excited about those coming back in because if I'm teaching eighth grade physical science, I'm going to get to go back and review seventh grade life science, but not review it in a purist sense. I'm going to get to integrate it. I'm going to talk about chemical equations, but for, through the lens of plant respiration and photosynthesis. Why? Because they didn't have as much time with that last year. So I'm going to integrate it. That's what I think we focus on. Avoid retention, avoid remediation, and talk about enrichment. So let me uh, take advantage of uh, the time we have left and engage in uh, a, a rapid fire question to each of you, give you about two minutes to answer. And it brings us back to what we were talking about at the beginning in terms of finance. Where do we invest and what should we skip? John, H? Well, I would be investing in teacher expertise. And sometimes that means bringing in coaches. It certainly means that I'd be investing in teachers uh, collective efficacy and collaboration, um, you know, using the, the line that John A used before, teach excellence is all around us. It's in our schools now. We just need the courage to recognize it and use it. Uh, so that's, uh, I'd be investing in, in, in uh, that. I'd be investing in uh, as, as, uh, looking at the interpretations teachers make about each kid. I'd be doing a lot of case management of individual children, not just with the teacher, 
but across the school. Because remember, in the school, sooner or later, most teachers are going to have that kid. So let's start those discussions right now. So that's where I'd be spending uh, most of my dollars. Um, I'd certainly spend some of it on the evaluation to make sure that we have the evidence that's made the difference so that this is a sustainable thing beyond just one or two years. And I think we have the opportunity to now to create a new normal. Nancy? I would invest in communication cycles. How is it that different parts of systems communicate with one another? This is an important point that John Hattie made a bit earlier as well. If we've got intervention that's sitting out there on the back 40 and there's no connection back to classrooms, then no matter how wonderful that intervention might be, no matter how wonderful the instruction might be in the classroom, we're not going to be able to capitalize on that. So investing in communication cycles is something that I would do. What I would skip are um, curricula that uh, make promises that they cannot keep. In other words, here's a magic bullet. All you have to do is invest all of those hundreds of thousands of dollars that you have and everything will be fine. Instead, think closely about how it is that you discover and diagnose, how it is that you look at intervention and implementation and how you evaluate the magnitude of those effects. John H. No, we did John H. John A. <laughs> he, he, I say, he, you might want to hear from him again anyway. Um, so, Nancy, the idea of, of, of curricula that promise certain things, I, you know, I think it's the difference between a short order cook and a chef. And, and, and chefs prepare meals based on their audience, based on who's in the room, and they make adjustments, but they have a set of skills, they have a set of tools, and they have a set of understandings that allow them to make adjustments based on who's sitting at that table so that it's palatable and enjoyable. Short order cooks just simply repeat, and it doesn't matter who's on the receiving end of that, that's just, what, that's just what's going to happen. And I think we have to reinvest in teachers and we have to recognize that teachers are chefs, they're master chefs. And so we have to make sure that we support them as they move into this new normal, but recognizing they have the professional expertise, it just now has to be refocused and, and reinvested into what we're about to do. And, and I think it's an awesome opportunity. Look, I, when I say reinvest in the teachers, this is when I get the most upset and get most agitated at those that aren't blessed enough to be in the field of education. Daggone it, these folks got up every day from March of 2019 when we shut it down to right now and found a way to connect to as many students as they possibly could. It's evidenced in the data. It's evidenced in the comments from students. It's evidenced in parents now begging for them to go back to school because they realize how hard the job is. The trick is we have to reinvest in teachers, but here's the catch. In a way that helps them evaluate their impact or assess whatever words you want to use and make it visible because we've got to be able to hold it up and say, look at what our teachers did. Look at how they took this opportunity and in the face of horrible adversity, they did exactly what we've always done in education. And so when I say reinvest, I mean in a way that helps them become their own advocates and their selling point are self-regulated learners that continue to move forward regardless of the context. Last question, Nancy, steps to take now, this summer, early beginning of the school year? I can tell you what we are doing right now in real time, and that is looking at our amazing re-engagement and attendance team that we have developed over the course of this year. And we're looking closely at how it is that we leverage all of the human capital that's there, as well as the social capital that those folks have built with students. We want to make sure that moving forward, that we continue to have that comprehensive uh, re-engagement um, re team. Johnny. Um, we are making sure that our students um, are engaged with us beyond the walls of our classroom. Uh, we will never miss an opportunity to engage with the learner again because we took it for granted when we 
were face to face and it was stripped from us. So one of the things we're making sure we do is a major outreach initiative where we are, we're using a strategy actually from uh, engagement by design, where we have a record of every student. We know who has made contact with that student, who has contacted that student, the status of that student. We know where that student works. We know where that student lives. We have some way to connect. If they like soccer, we're reading up on soccer or football, excuse me. We're reading up on that. If they're, in other words, getting to know those students as human beings, not as a test score and not as a tuition payment. And Johnny. That, that was my first one too, the case management. Uh, but it's not just case management at the teacher level. It's sharing it across teachers because it's the interpretation of those case management that matters. And this is where the expertise of other teachers of the school that can reflect on those students. And so the case management across the school, every, every student has a kind of an, an IEP, an individual education plan. We look at every student in terms of the goals using the, the Goldilocks principle and making sure that it's challenging short-term, medium-term, long-term goals for each student. And we don't presume, we look at that as a one-on-one -on -one before we start bringing it together. The second thing we can do right now is that notion of coaching. Coaching the teachers and coaching individual students and that we can do some fast track to accelerate uh, our understanding of each student, our understanding of their progress. And we can start picking up some of the, the gaps that uh, may have happened over the last year and start ameliorating some of those. And we can do that right now. And the beauty of doing that kind of coaching is it does help create time for teachers to do that first exercise of case management and sharing interpretations. What an amazing panel. Three of you, just incredible amount of information. This is being recorded. There are a lot of people asking in the chat box, uh, can we get a, a tape of this recording? You absolutely can. You're gonna wanna hear this over and over again because there's so much information. Thank you so much to the three of you. And Sanja, I turn it back to you. Yeah. Well, I think you've started us with understanding that there's so many opportunities to continue to engage with each one of the panelists that have been presenting to us today. One of the ways is, as you see, hot off the press is this book called Rebound. And a lot of what was shared today and even more is packed in that wonderful book there. So please make sure you go to the Corwin website um, or you can get it off of Amazon. But a lot of the conversation that have started today can continue through this book. But guess what else? If you want to go even deeper into understanding a lot of the principles that John and John and Nancy have provided today, you can also go to institutes. So we have institutes um, where it's like a conference format. Um, again, go to our website. You can find out more about that. And then there are consulting services. So if you want to go even deeper with the unique members of your team in your unique district, we can provide consulting services on all of the opportunities that you heard about today. So great questions. We didn't get a chance to answer all of them. However, if you engage with us and continue this conversation, because we need for you to, not because it's something that is outside of what educators should do. This is the time to talk about what are we going to do to make the next normal a better normal? So we thank you for coming and learning with us today. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Noel. Thank you for the partnerships that we have with AASA and AESA to continue this. Please make sure you access that white paper. Many of you received it um, earlier prior to the session, but we also dropped the link in the chat if you didn't receive it then so that you can continue your learning. And we thank you for choosing to learn with Corwin and AASA. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, panelists. Really appreciate each and every one of you. Bye, everybody. And